All right, now, the next group of invertebrates that we're going to take a look at are the arthropods. And at this point, hopefully you're getting a lot better at figuring out what these terms refer to. So we know now that pod means foot. And this arthro means jointed, like arthritis. So we have jointed feet. And included in this group are a wide variety of organisms, including the trilobites, the meristomata, which are the horseshoe crabs, the pycnogonids, those are the sea spiders, the arachnids, which we don't see that many in the world of marine life, and then finally the crustacea. And that's the group that we'll focus most of our time on. So this group included the trilobites, <clears throat> which are the oldest of the arthropods. They were around more than 520 million years ago. That's a long time. And at that point in time, they already had a hard exoskeleton. They already had really well-developed eyes for that point in time. This was when the continents were all clumped together in Pangaea, and much of what we now know was above water was at that point underwater. These organisms were called the butterflies of the sea, and they have since evolved into 20,000 different species of arthropods. This group also includes the pycnogonids, right? These are the sea spiders, and if you look at that particular image, you can see why. And these pycnogonids are pretty remarkable. There's about a thousand extant species right now, most of them crawl, but some of them swim. They can grow to 70 centimeters in diameter, and they eat a wide variety of things, from algae to worms to hydroids to anemones. And they all have a proboscis, this feeding organism, very different on the very different species. They also have some ovigerous legs, and if you see down here on this one, at this point in time, you can see that the ovigure is right there. And some species, it's just in the males, and other species, it's both males and females. But this is a group where the males carry the eggs. They bear the eggs after fertilization and carry them around. All right, so it's a pretty cool and interesting group in terms of reproduction. They have some courtship, all right, and they also are a group that can live from the surface to 7,000 meters deep and from warm water to very, very, very cool waters. Uniquely enough, this is a group without a sea loam, but it's pretty clear that they evolved from a group that does, or did at that point, have a sea loam. And so this is a secondary evolutionary characteristic, the loss of the sea loam over time in the pycnogonids. Now the horseshoe crabs, right, the meristomata, these haven't been quite on the earth as long, just a scant 420 million years did they seem to appear on this planet. But they haven't changed much since, hence the idea that they are a living fossil. Their appearance predated insects and dinosaurs, and they're kind of a remarkable group in that they have ten eyes that you can't really see so well when you first look, but if you look up at this particular diagram, you can see a variety of eyes here. They've got ten different eyes, some of them simple and some of them compound. Additionally, underneath, they've got six or five or six pairs of book gills, which is a primitive uh, respiration organ underneath there, and they have 750 different individual muscles in this organism. The arthropods also include the candy cane shrimp and other mandibulates. Mandible refers to jaw. These are snapping shrimp. They can make tremendously powerful sounds with a lot of force by snapping their claws. This particular one is nearly blind and generally lives in a symbiotic relationship with a small fish called a goby. The pistol shrimp, on the other hand, aside from looking like a basset hound, has a claw that can produce remarkable force when it snaps it shut. And this is how it stuns its prey. And once the prey is stunned, then it has all the time in the world to feed on them. The arthropods also include the skeleton shrimp, which you've seen before in the classroom and the lab. And these skeleton shrimp, they do really look like praying mantises. And they actually share one really kind of interesting feature with the praying mantis is that some species the female does eat the male after they have finished mating. In addition, 
right? These feed on anything from diatoms and detritus to amphipods that swim by. And after they have mated, the females will carry their eggs in this brood pouch right here, and they actually hatch directly out into the water as adults, so there's no larval stage in these skeleton shrimp. Also included in the arthropods are the copepods, all right? This means oar foot from the Latin, so copepod means oar foot. These are the most numerous multi-celled organisms in the aquatic world. They can grow up to 10 millimeters in length, and they exist in really extreme habitats as well as more normal habitats, from hydrothermal vents to the polar ice caps, and from the surface of the water to the truly deepest parts of the oceans. There's 21,000 different species that we know about, and they have the unique honor of being the organism that can swim the fastest for its body size of any organism on the planet. So the amphipods are also part of this arthropod group. We've seen a lot of these amphipods this year. The scuds are amphipods, the big-eyed scud that we saw so much in the tide pools early in the fall. And you can see here that this is indeed a big-eyed scud right here. They're compressed laterally, which means side to side. And the amphi part refers to the fact that they have different length legs. All of the arthropods have bilateral symmetry, which means that they're directional in their lifestyle. They are in pursuit of something or able to get away from something. And this leads them to more advanced characteristics than some of the organisms that we've seen so far. Arthropods are considered to be the single most successful group of organisms on the planet. And the reason that they get this designation is because they have the greatest sheer number of organisms and number of types of organisms, and they live in the highest variety of our environments on the planet. So the question is, what is it about them that makes them so successful in these ways? And you guessed it, the answer is the exoskeleton. Next question, what is it about the exoskeleton that makes it such a benefit? So one of your tasks in this particular assignment is to come up with what you think of as two advantages and two disadvantages to having an exoskeleton like these organisms do. What are two advantages and two disadvantages? And you'll include that in your work here. So the other thing that's figured into the tremendous success of the arthropods are the many different kinds of specialized appendages. Those specialized appendages, and you can see appendages here, 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 these are all appendages. They, with their own specific design and unique functions, make them very adept at survival in a wide variety of environments. Even their mouth parts are former specialized legs that have now become part of the food acquisition chewing process in these arthropods. And there are three basic body parts in the arthropod body. Here's the trilobite with its three, one and two, and then finally the third. If we look at the crustacean world, we've got a head region, we have a thorax region, and we have an abdomen region. So the head the thorax and the abdomen are the three major body regions in these arthropods. If you take a look inside these critters and you see that they've got a liver, that they've got a heart, that they've got a stomach and intestines, all of these point towards, you got it, organ level development. Then take a look here. In this next slide, we're talking about the circulatory system, and as you can see, they've got arteries, closed vessels, another artery here, they have a heart here, a systemic heart pumping blood out to the rest of the body, and then down here, they have this thing called a hemoseal, right, the hemoseal. If you look, heme refers to blood, and what do you remember about seal? If you think about spongio seal, what kind of area was that? So given that information... You're going to also have to figure out what kind of circulatory system they have. From a digestive perspective, we can see that they've got a mouth at this end, they have an anus at this end, so they clearly have a flow-through digestive system, right, much like most of the bilateral symmetrical organisms. 
But here you see that they've got a cardiac stomach and a pyloric stomach. So one question for you is, why two stomachs? Why do these organisms have two stomachs instead of just one? Shifting to the respiratory system, while this is a crayfish, the basic design is the same for lobsters. Each of these are where walking legs are attached, and there's the carapace coming over the top of these, and the gills themselves, and there's a gill arch, if you will, or a gill plate that's connected to the base of each of these walking legs. So the question for you is, how is this design well suited for gas exchange in an organism that does a lot of walking? What would happen when they walked if the gills are connected to the base of the walking legs? The next question is, how advanced is this nervous system? If we take a look here, we can see that they have a brain. This brain is right here. It's a collection of uh, maybe 30,000 neurons or more, right? And then that's connected to a ventral nerve cord, which comes down here, right? Each of these sections has its own little ganglion, which is a little mini brain or a little cluster of nerves, right? And then going on the dorsal side, there is a dorsal nerve cord as well. We'll spend some time talking in class, and you'll do some reading that will explore just how complex and sophisticated the behavior of lobsters happens to be, and then we can decide the level of advancement in this nervous system. Connected to the nervous system are, are all of the abilities to sense things in the world, and you can take a look here. We clearly see these big, long antenna. We've also got these other structures, the antennules in the front, and then if you look at the end of some of the appendages, also on the base of the tail, you can see they've got sensory hairs, they've got openings in the shell, um, and the setae are the little sensory hair structures. And so if you've got a hard exoskeleton, it's kind of tough to get information through it. But if you have specialized structures on the edges of that, or little indentations that have specialized sensory cells, you could get a lot more information than at first glance it looks like you can having a hard exoskeleton. So we'll spend a whole lot of time talking about lobster communication and how important the sense of smell is in lobster communication. Here you can see this arrow pointing to the antennule. Right? This is the smaller of the two structures that come off the head region. Those antennules are where the chemosensory structures are. This is how they pick up chemical information from the environment. From the vision perspective, lobsters have eyes that lack lenses. We took a lens out of the squid eye, but the lobster eye does not have a lens. Instead, this is a compound eye, and you'll see on the next slide why that's the case. So like bees and other insects, they have a very different form of vision than we have. Here's the surface of the lobster eye. You can see each one of these little visual units here. Each of these is a separate little lens area. There's more than 10,000 of them on the typical lobster eye. Here is a cross-section of the lobster eye. Each one of these areas here is one of those visual units that I just drew on the previous slide. All right, we're looking at the cross-section. This is light coming down, and it strikes each of these visual units and then bounces off the uh, more pyramidal or cone-like structure here and then gets reflected into a central area here on the inner part of the lobster eye, the retina there. So there's about 10,000 of these little reflector or individual visual units called omatidia, and they send information, a whole group of them sends information to one part of the retina, and that gets transmitted to the lobster's brain. Interestingly, this is not a very acute form of vision. They can send movement and shadow and light and dark and things like that, but they are not very adept at color vision nor at fine detail. And with that, we'll close up this first part of our investigation into the arthropods. We'll take a look specifically at crustaceans in the next section, but I want to leave you with this question. How are lobsters like humans? See if you can come up with five ways that you think lobsters are like humans.